We're on. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. I sincerely pray that you receive the honor that you deserve on this Mother's Day. This is not going to be a Mother's Day message, um, but we will have um, a time of honoring you, so please stick around. There's food and gifts. It'll be worth sticking around. This morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 7, the first 10 verses. If you want to turn there, Luke 7, 1 through 10. What does it mean to have faith? I mean real faith. In other words, what is the faith that grabs God's attention that makes him notice? Well, this morning we're going to read about such faith. Luke chapter 7. After he had finished all these sayings, Jesus had been preaching on the plain. After he had finished all these sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a centurion had a slave who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent, him, uh, sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his slave. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him. For he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and let my slave be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave well. Father, we come before your word this morning. We come before you. And we ask you, through the power of your spirit, and the promise of your life-giving word to speak it to our hearts. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Capernaum must have been a nice posting for a centurion, right? A nice rural hamlet on the green hills sloping down to the blue waters of the Sea of Galilee. Marcus loved it here. Okay, we don't know what his name was. I'm going to call him Marcus this morning because it helps the, the story to flow. It's a good Roman name. When he first arrived in Capernaum, years before, Marcus had his problems with the population. The Jews here had a very different life with their rituals and their religion and their insistence on taking an entire day off from work every single week. It was maddening. The 1,500 or so inhabitants were made up of of, um, a mixture of fishermen, herdsmen, farmers, tradesmen. The town locally was known as Kafar Nahum, that is the village of Nahum, or the village of comfort. Now Marcus, like all centurions, had earned his position in the Roman army by serving well in battle. Known for their battlehood, battlefield daring and courage, centurions commanded anywhere from 80 to 200 men. And it was their job to train these men and to discipline them in their command to be ready for battle. Well, fortunately for Marcus, in this lazy backwater village, he didn't have to worry too much about war. Now, his job was more just to be a Roman presence so that all would know that the Romans were, in fact, the rulers and the masters of this land and its people. But Marcus learned very early on (laughs) that it is much easier to manage a subjugated population by understanding them rather than by brutality. And as time went along, Marcus, seeking to understand the Jews, actually came to appreciate them. Unlike the average Roman, the majority of these people lived a life of simple faith in their God they called Yahweh. And that produced a very honest, moral populace 
whose diligence and work was matched only by their hatred for their Roman occupiers. Now, Marcus, he grew up with a pantheon of capricious, bickering gods who were as evil as the men who worshipped him. So this all-powerful, morally perfect, gracious Yahweh actually grabbed Marcus's attention. See, Marcus knew this. Part of understanding any people group is also understanding their deities. At least that's what Marcus told himself, so he began to discuss with the Jewish leaders. And they were more than happy to share the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, with this pagan Roman. Well, Marcus was drawn to this God who was good and holy and consistent and who had graciously and firmly led and protected Israel for centuries. As his appreciation for Yahweh grew, his appreciation for Yahweh's people, the Jews, also grew. And ultimately, it led Marcus to want to build a synagogue in Capernaum for the Jews. I mean, he could afford it. The average Roman soldier made 300 denarii a year. Centurions made 10 to 20 times that much. Now, not only was the synagogue a gift to the people and the elders who had accepted him and taught him, but I think deep down, just judging from the text, that this was also an offering to Yahweh. Can't prove it. Now, centurions were known throughout the Roman Empire, throughout the, the known world, for their leadership skills, for their intelligence, and for their integrity. We actually see that throughout the New Testament. Every time centurions are mentioned in the New Testament, they're men of steady countenance and integrity. We see that right here in Luke chapter 7. We see it in Luke 23 at the cross. We see it in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. Now, Luke, being a Gentile, wants us to know that. And 23 of the times that centurions are mentioned in the New Testament, 19 of them come from Luke, either from the Gospel of Luke or from Acts that Luke also wrote. The ancient Roman writer Vegetius wrote this about centurions, quote, The centurion in the infantry is chosen for his size, strength, and dexterity in throwing his missile weapons, and for his skill in the use of his sword and shield. In short, for his expertness, in all the exercises. He is to be vigilant, temperate, temperate, and readier to execute the orders he receives than to talk. Strict in exercising and keeping up proper discipline among his soldiers in obliging them to appear clean and well-dressed and to have their arms constantly rubbed and bright. So obviously the years of conquest and battle tempered these men with a kind of moral integrity. And that certainly holds true for our centurion that we're calling Marcus. We can only imagine that the years of death and destruction and battle had caused him to value life more, even for the lives of his household slaves. Look at verse 2. Luke tells us that he had a slave who was highly valued by him. Now that translation might be a little misleading. Luke actually uses a word there that means he was highly regarded by this centurion. He was dear to him. Maybe that's the best translation. It's, it's not the idea that he was worth a lot of money. It was that he loved him. And then this dear slave became ill to the point of death. I have no doubt that Marcus had spent lots of money on physicians and healers trying to help his sick slave to no avail. And now he was dying. Death was apparently imminent. But as Marcus was losing hope, someone runs to him and informs him that, in fact, the healer is back in town. He's back. He's been away. But this man they call Yeshua, he's back again. Jesus had worked many miracles in Capernaum by this time. Some time ago, Jesus had decided to use Capernaum as his base of operations. It was his headquarters. And every time Jesus worked miracles there, crowds gathered at first, that was a headache for Marcus because no Roman centurion wants crowds gathering in his town because crowds can become unruly. But this Jesus was truly astounding. He wielded a power and spoke with an authority that Marcus had never seen, not even in the Roman military. When Jesus spoke in the synagogue, his words were like nothing Marcus had ever heard. He spoke with authority. Not as though he was explaining what was written, 
but as though he had written it. He spoke from God's word as if he himself were speaking. When challenged by a demoniac, Jesus simply commanded the demon to leave the man, and it left him, (laughs) but not without proclaiming Jesus to be the Holy One of God. Jesus ordered a fever to leave a woman, and it was gone. He ordered a leper to be clean, and all the sores vanished. When the crowds gathered in front of Simon the fisherman's house, one evening, he healed everyone who was sick in the crowd and delivered all those who had demons. And all this happened in Capernaum, right under Marcus's watch. As a soldier, the absolute authority of Jesus deeply impressed this centurion. In fact, one day, Jesus had actually commanded, or excuse me, proclaimed to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Well, that made the Pharisees mad. Who can forgive sin except God alone? To which Jesus simply responded by telling the paralyzed man to stand up and walk. He commanded a paralyzed man to stand up and the man obeyed. That is the kind of authority that this Jesus was wielding. From a military perspective, it made Marcus take notice. And it also made perfect sense. See, the authority of Jesus was a different kind of authority. It was a spiritual authority. Sure, it showed evidence here in this physical realm with the healings and all, but Jesus' authority was really outside of this realm. He had the authority to command spirits and to command diseases and to even forgive sin on earth. So now when Marcus hears that this Jesus is back in town, he immediately thinks, well, he's helping everybody else. He can help my slave. But how? I mean, this holy man is of a different realm than me. You know Marcus is thinking that. How can an uncircumcised Roman possibly come before Jesus? I've got blood on my hands from all these battles. Uncircumcised. I can't go before this man. Well, Marcus had learned the ways of the Hebrews well enough to know that when faced with the necessity of approaching somebody above you in power and authority, you get an intermediary. So that's what Marcus did. He went to some friends of his, the elders of the synagogue that he had built, and he asked them to go speak to this Jesus to see if he'd come heal his slave. See, Marcus knew for a fact that Jesus could heal the slave, but would he help a Roman? Well, of course, the elders were more than willing to go speak to Jesus for him. These men lived by a system of merit. They worked all the time to earn their place, both with men and with God. If any Gentile was deserving of Jesus' attention, it would be this centurion who had demonstrated his love for Israel and for Capernaum by building the synagogue. He is worthy. That was their plea to Jesus. He's worthy. He deserves to have you come. Look at what he's done. Now, sitting under the portico of his villa overlooking the sea, Marcus began to have doubts. He began to have second thoughts about inviting Jesus to his house now that he had a chance to think about it. And Jesus was obviously a very important man, a man of great authority in a kingdom that Marcus was just beginning to try to understand. This leader was unlike any Marcus had ever met. He was kind and humble. He was the soft-spoken leader of a small band of ragtag disciples. There was nothing about his appearance that would make you remark on him or anything about the appearance of his followers. But when he spoke, hmm, when he spoke, when this Jesus spoke, all creation listened to him. Now, that meant a lot to Marcus who commanded slaves and soldiers with word and whip. And he realized suddenly that his authority was very basic compared to Jesus. Marcus knew that his authority had nothing whatsoever to do with himself, with his own authority or with his ability. Any authority that Marcus wielded came directly from Rome, from Caesar himself. 
Marcus knew he was a nobody, simply an extension of the great Roman military machine. Jesus, on the other hand, he wielded his own authority. He had the authority to command demons. Demons who came out asking Jesus not to destroy them. He had the authority to forgive sins. The authority to banish leprosy and to banish diseases. While sitting there, Marcus is keenly aware that he exercises authority over people in situations simply by the authority of Rome under the threat of pain. The terror of torture and death, that's how Marcus ruled. Jesus, on the other hand, it was obvious that he was wielding an authority in a different realm. And instead of bringing pain and death, Jesus' authority always brought healing and life. And while he's sitting there pondering these things, suddenly a runner shows up on his porch saying, Jesus is he's coming and he's almost here. Are you ready? And Marcus realizes, I can't have this man here at my house. This is a holy man on a different plane than me. He's in an entirely different league. So he quickly grabs some friends and he sends them to Jesus with a word-for-word -word quote that he wants them to quote to Jesus in the first person. Verse 6, if you want to read with me. I want you to get this right, so say this as though I'm with you. Lord. Wow. Lord. Remember who's speaking here the Roman centurion who wields the most power in town, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not consider myself worthy to come to you. Lord, at that word, Jesus stops short, and he was amazed, we're told, at what he was hearing. Lord? That is not a word that you would expect to come from a Roman officer's lips toward a Jew who is subjected to Roman rule. I mean, you would only say Lord to a person that you see as higher in authority than you. It's the same as saying master from a Roman officer. See, suddenly Marcus realizes, I am very small, very insignificant, very unworthy, and I am unrighteous. Lord, do not trouble yourself. In other words, as a Gentile, I know that you coming into my house would make you unclean. And that probably will mean a very lengthy ritual purification process. Don't trouble yourself. Besides, you are Lord over creation. I know that. And I'm just a man. And I am certainly not worthy to have you come into my house. I didn't even come to you in the first place. I sent the elders to go and speak for me because I don't think I deserve even to be before you. But here's the thing. I know who you are. You don't have to come to me and I don't have to go to you and I don't have to carry my slave to you because the power of your authority is not limited by time and space. Look at verse 7. The centurion says to Jesus, but only say the word and let my slave be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now, unlike the scribes and the Pharisees, Marcus doesn't have the biblical background to be able to piece together all the pieces that would tell you what kind of power and authority the coming Messiah should wield. But Marcus does have the military background and he, if there's one thing he knows, it's authority and chain of command. And this Jesus is clearly Lord, a Lord who wields ultimate power over creation, a power that is not of this world. I think it's clear from the text to see that this Roman centurion recognized exactly who Jesus was. Unfortunately, the scribes and the Pharisees the priests, for all their training in the Old Testament scriptures, 
were blind, not only to Jesus' authority, but to their own brokenness, to their own spiritual poverty. Not Marcus. Marcus knows who he is, and he knows who Jesus is. You know, there's another Roman centurion in the Bible who recognized who Jesus was. Do you remember him? That day at the foot of the cross when Jesus cried out, to Tetelestai, it is finished. He gave up his spirit and the earth shuddered and all creation shook with a mighty earthquake. That Roman centurion at the foot of the cross next to Jesus cried out, truly this was the Son of God. And what an unspeakable tragedy for those Jewish leaders there that day to be in the presence of the Creator, face to face with majesty, and to be blind to his identity because of the hardness of their hearts. Well, that wasn't Marcus's problem. He knew for a fact who Jesus was, and he also knew that he could not stand in Jesus' presence. But he still loves his slave, and he still needs something to happen for his slave. He wants him to be healed. And he still knows Jesus can do this, if he will. Not as a wizard or a magician, not by incantations and potions, but as the one who has the authority to command creation, to command life. So he quickly sends word to Jesus, Lord, I know who you are. I don't need you to come to me to do this. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. I know how to give commands and make people obey. And they do. And I've seen you command your forces and they obey. And those words stopped Jesus in his tracks. Look at verse 9. It says, Jesus marveled at what he heard. Some of your versions say that he was amazed. There's only one other time in the whole New Testament where we're told that Jesus was amazed. That was in Nazareth when Jesus revealed himself to his hometown by reading from Isaiah. And his hometown people took him out to a cliff to throw him off. And we're told that Jesus marveled at their unbelief. Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. And here we're told that he's amazed by this centurion, this Gentile's faith. You know, it takes a lot to amaze God. This man caught God's attention. How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, Isaiah 66 verse 2 says, This is the one to whom I will look. This is the one who gets my attention. This is the one who turns my head. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. This is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Is there any better description of our centurion than that right there? I mean, certainly, Marcus is humble and contrite. While the Gentile leaders are saying, he's worthy, he deserves your attention, Jesus, Marcus is absolutely convinced of the opposite, that he's not worthy. And he says it. Look at that at the end of verse 6. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. And I think he trembles at his word. Look at verse 7. He says, I, I don't consider myself worthy to come to you, but only say the word. I know the power is in your word, Jesus. Only say the word and my slave will be healed. I know your power and I know the authority that you wield. Just speak it and it'll happen. He doesn't know if Jesus will do it, but he knows Jesus can do it if he chooses to. And at that point, Jesus turns to all those who are following, including his own disciples, and he says, I tell you, not even in Israel have I seen such faith. And we're told the slave was healed that very hour in the book of Matthew chapter 8. The Jewish elders had a merit-based understanding of God. In other words, like most Americans, the Jewish mindset was that if you do good and you behave yourself, God will do what you ask. You know, if you give enough money to God, he'll enrich you. If you give your time to God, if you, if you help the, the unfortunate, he'll give you what you want. Even heaven, if you're good. And I think most people think they're good. I mean, ask them. Walk up to anybody. 
and ask them, would you consider yourself to be a good person? The vast majority of people will say, well, sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't go around robbing banks and killing people. I think I'm a good person. All right. Well, if you're a good person, how does your goodness me measure up to God's commands? How do you think you measure up just with the Ten Commandments, to be basic? Well, most people don't know the Ten Commandments, so you might have to help them out with a few. Start with lies. Ask the person, have you ever told a lie? Well, sure. How many? You mean in my life? Yeah. How many lies have you told in your life? I can't count them. What do you call a person who tells countless lies? A liar. Okay. Here's another commandment. Have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever taken anything that's not yours? Even a little thing? Well, sure, I'm sure I have. I mean, I don't go around robbing banks, but yeah, I've probably taken something. What do you call a person who takes things that's not theirs? A liar. How about this, a thief, I'm sorry. Have you ever, have you ever used God's name in vain? I'm a liar too. <laughs> have you ever used God's name in vain? And that doesn't necessarily have to be a cuss word. Just, oh my God. If you're not talking to God or about God, that's using God's name in vain. Have you ever done that? You know, it's very serious. It's called blasphemy. We've only got three. Have you ever committed adultery? Jesus said, if you lust after another person in your heart, you've committed adultery with that person. Have you ever done that? Guilty. So, you can say to the person, by your own admission, you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, and an adulterer at heart. And on judgment day, you will have to stand before a holy and righteous judge. How do you think he's going to judge you, innocent or guilty? Well, the Bible makes it clear that we're all sinners. Every single one of us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all broken God's law, and since God is a holy God, he says he will condemn sinners to hell. And that's all of us. Revelation 21, 8. But as, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, as for sorcerers, murderers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That's what we all deserve. And a person might say, well, yeah, but God's a loving God. He understands us, and certainly he'll make allowances for us, right? Well, it is true. God is a loving God, but he's also a just God. And a just judge might love a criminal who comes into his courtroom, but if he's a just judge, he will give that criminal what he deserves. And God is a just judge, and we know what we deserve. The Jews thought, that God gave them the law to save them. They thought that if they could just keep the law well enough that they could work their way to heaven. The problem is, like us, they couldn't. They couldn't keep it. They kept breaking it. And yet it is true, God is a loving God. But instead of letting us off the hook and letting us walk free even though we're guilty, God made a way by paying the penalty for us. He sent his only son to come and die. He came and lived a perfect life and then died as a perfect sacrifice so that he could offer to us what we need, which is forgiveness, what Romans chapter 5 calls the gift of righteousness, a gift of salvation. And all you have to do is receive it by faith. It's a free gift. Jesus commends this centurion for his faith. And then he says, I don't see that kind of faith in Israel. The Jews really believed that by their hard work, they could be good, and they could make themselves worthy of God's favor. But the centurion knew, even after building a synagogue for God, that he was just a guilty sinner. And yet he was still absolutely convinced that Jesus was Lord over creation. And so he calls him Lord. And he knew that if Jesus did this for him, it wasn't because he earned it. It wasn't because he deserved it. It wasn't because of any merit on his part. It was simply because of Jesus' kindness and his grace. <clears throat> I hope you see the difference. 
The Jewish elders came to Jesus for what they thought they could get from him. Jesus was healing people all over Capernaum. So why not heal the slave of our friend who built us a synagogue? People today do this all the time. I know what I want and I think God can give it to me. So they go to God and they focus on what they want rather than on God. And that's not faith. In fact, that's the opposite of faith. This is a little bit like writing a wish list to Santa. Have you ever thought about that? The whole Santa myth. <laughs> you know the thing about Santa is you never actually have to meet the guy. Right? You write him a letter. You send it off to the North Pole. He shows up in the middle of the night, dumps a bunch of gifts under the tree, and he got, he's gone. You never have to see him. You never have to have a relationship with him. Do you do that with God? While the Jews were focused on what Jesus could do, the centurion was focused on who Jesus was. And Jesus was both amazed and delighted by the difference. And so he heals the slave with just a word. 